Let's keep trying, so hopefully we'll get in. But our only other apology is Peter Scott uh, from the Trust. So I'm uh, I'm just making sure I've, I've not missed anybody else. I don't think in that all of that melee. So we, we will start. So just in terms then of um, big welcome to yourself, Sue, as a member of the public. We'll try and see if there are any other members of the public that we can get the thing out on the website too. Uh, I, I'm doubtful, but at least we'll try and cover that base. But just going on to item two, um, is there anything in terms of declarations of interest for any of the items on the part one of the agenda for anybody? Um, I'm thinking that there won't be. Happy with that? Yeah, there's nothing declared. Yeah. So just then in terms of minutes and the action log for the for the governing body on the 18th of November, is there anything in terms of accuracy of the minutes that anybody wants to pick up? Um, just quickly going through the pages, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I'm just crawling up the screen. Eleven. That's it. We okay? And I think one of the things I would say is is the reason why we're back on to teams. Uh, because the meeting was supposed to be held at Salterbeck, uh, one of the places that we normally go to. Sadly, with the increase before Christmas of Omicron, etc., we've decided to go back to Teams just for the safety of, of obviously as many people as possible. We will review that on an ongoing basis, but I have to say it's probably unlikely at this moment in time that we'll, uh, you know, return back to any kind of public-facing meeting in person in the short term. So. Just in terms then of the the uh, anything that action wise, I don't think there's anything I've got on the action log at all. Uh, any matters arising from there that are not covered in the agenda that anybody wants to pick up? No. OK. Um, just then in terms of the next item, which is item four. Uh, normal thing that we do here is a verbal update from Peter and then Ed to cover current situation with COVID, any system pressures associated to that and of course the winter. And then obviously had to take us through the vaccination. So we're well versed in this and we, we have had obviously numerous briefings on this over the last uh, few months. So I'm going to hand over to you first, Peter, if you if you just want to take us through some of the key points you want to mention around COVID and system pressures. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, perhaps if I if I just begin with um, something brief on the uh, community transmission rates. Um, so the the information on new new cases per hundred thousand population per week will enter the public domain tomorrow as part of the normal uh, director of public health report. So it would be wrong for me to bring that information into this meeting now, John, as it is a a meeting held in public. Okay, um, but to give a, a broad indication over the over the winter period. Um, kind of mid-December um, through January, there was a very, very steep rise in community transmission rates across all of Cumbria um, and indeed across the country, driven by the the Omicron variant. So you all you all know and understand that. There were times in Cumbria where two of our district councils, um, so Barrow outside the CCG area and also Copeland had some of the highest um, transmission rates in the country. Um, in fact, they featured at spot one and two for a, for a short period. And at the peak, um, through the first couple of weeks in, in January, the transmission rates were triple, uh, in fact, possibly slightly higher, triple what they had been in the peak in January 21. So very, very high community transmission rates. Um, thankfully, there is good evidence that those rates are starting to significantly recede. So the, the most recent period will be uh, substantially lower. Um, of course, there's lots of uh, modelling, insightful professional speculation, etc. about how the, the virus may develop over the the coming weeks uh, and indeed years, but the community transmission rates are definitely um, going down, but still very high. Thankfully, um, 
the high tran community rates have not translated into the same level of very severe disease that we experienced this time last year. And that's um, a, a consequence really of, of two things. Um, one, there's clear evidence that although Omicron is still a very serious variant, it can cause severe disease, it doesn't have the same propensity to cause as much severe disease in, in as many people. Um, but secondly, and probably much more significantly, the vaccine programme has clearly offered very significant pre uh, protection to prevent severe disease. So although we've had up to three, three times higher community transmission rates, um, the peak number of people in hospital in North Cumbria with COVID, so not necessarily um, with a COVID sickness, but with COVID, including incidental sickness, at its peak just tipped over 100 people on one particular day. Um, many of you will recall uh, last January 2021, it peaked at over 300. So that gives you an indication that the, the COVID pressure has not been um, anything like as high from this current uh, wave than some of the previous waves. However, however, the, the very big challenge for the NHS locally, regionally and nationally, and definitely for our partners in social care, has been the very high rates of staff absence due to COVID. So staff sickness rates have been at a record high. They've been very significantly higher than would normally be the case um, in winter, even with a very bad flu season. For either staff with COVID or needing to isolate or um, indeed the impact on their family caring responsibilities, etc. Again, there is um, good reason to be positive that that is starting to be an improved position, but still very challenging. And that has meant that there have been all kinds of business continuity and other urgent pressures across all services. And by way of indication, our colleagues in social care, many, many of the residential and nursing homes have had temporary closure to admission due to either COVID outbreak and or um, staff absence. So it's been a really, really tough time for the whole of health and care services, um, partly because of severe disease, but most certainly because of staff absence. Um, as you all have seen the um, national announcements yesterday about some of the removal of the so-called Plan B restrictions and a clear national route to continue to remove those restrictions, and we will need to see the impact of that in due course. Um, I'll stop there, Chair. Happy to um, add any detail that I can if there are any particular questions, but hopefully that gives a, a reasonable overview before Red updates you on the truly amazing work everyone's done on the vaccine programme. OK, thank you, Peter. Uh, are there any questions or comments specifically on the situation that we've just described there? Colin? It's just an observation. Um, and uh, Peter's been very careful um, about sharing any particular um, um, documents from public health at the moment because of the reasons he outlined. But I think it is worthwhile for the government body to consider, or at least be knowledgeable about the consideration of moving from a, an illness that is called a pandemic to an illness that is labelled as endemic. Um, we can't go into great, very great detail of it here other than to say that um, that will actually change things and that will that, and that's that's the basis of the outline that we'll have to understand John when and if those conversations are more publicly available I just wanted to sort of frame that space obviously we don't get to make those calls and it's often in the national gift but that's the kind of thing we'll be talking about okay thank you for that clarification Colin Peter did you want to add something to that yeah, I, I think that we will probably want to return to this issue um, much more clearly and thoroughly along the lines that Colin described. But for now, just to be 
clear for colleagues, um, and I know Colin's not saying this, um, this is not endemic, it is pandemic. Um, technically, to become endemic, you would you would need a, an R rate of, of one or below, albeit with sporadic localised outbreaks. That's not currently the case. And even when something is endemic, it does not mean it is not serious. Okay. Um, so, but but Colin's right. There does appear to be um, certainly certainly in the country that we're fortunate enough to live in. There does appear to be um, a general movement that may lead to this being being kind of reclassified as as endemic. I guess the lay term would be something we all learn to live with, which right. doesn't mean it's not serious. Um, okay. But I think I think Colin prompts a good point and something that we might want to return to perhaps at the next meeting. Thank you, Peter. Any other comments or queries? OK, I'm going to move on then. Uh, Ed, you want to, as was quite thanks, nicely Tom. introduced from Peter, talk about the great work of the vaccination. Thank you very much. And thanks, Peter. Afternoon, everybody. Um, so let's do headlines. The headlines are um, 260,000 people over have had their first jab. So that's 89%. 244,000 have had their seconds, which is 88%. And just over 200,000 have had their boosters, which is 85%. When you when you drill down into that a little bit more, obviously looking at those people that are most at risk are people over 50. So this is cohorts one to nine. 95.2% um, have had their first, 94% have had their seconds, and 85% have had their boosters. So in terms of protecting those most at risk, we've got some really high numbers there, and they benchmark really well nationally, regionally and locally. So very good figures within that. The um, the next stage at the moment is getting second doses to 16 and 17 year olds. Going through the schools phase two. So this is the 12 to 15 year olds. Um, at, the, at the moment with the first jabs with 12 to 15 year olds, the North East North Cumbria figure was 50%. So the uptake with that age group has been not great. So 50% is the North East North Cumbria figure. In North Cumbria, we've had 62% of that age group. So once again, it's it's lower than our other figures, but comparatively with North East and North Cumbria, it's really quite high. Um, housebound figures, 95%, immunosuppressed, 93.2%. Over 85% of people with learning disabilities and then one group that we've really tried to target and continue to target are pregnant women, which is sitting at the moment at 54%. Um, we're working at the moment with the next phase of the 5 to 11 year olds. So this is 5 to 11 year olds who are clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, a really, really difficult group. So this is a, obviously a group of small, small children who won't follow the processes that we've got in place at the moment as well. So if you think about when you got your jabs, you're probably in and out within kind of five. Well, you'd have been in and out five minutes for your jab and then wait your 15 minutes afterwards. Five to 11 year olds, it's it's a different kettle of fish in terms of it's going to take longer. They're going to need to have a parent or a guardian with them. Um, the government have said that they don't want this to happen in schools. So at the moment, we're just trying to work out, well, who's going to do it then? So if the school teams can't do it, at the moment we're polling our primary care colleagues and our community pharmacies to see who wants to opt into this work. Because what's likely to happen at the moment is whilst we're on the 5 to 11s who are clinically extremely vulnerable, I think we're all believing very soon, probably within the next three or four weeks, all of the 5 to 11 year olds will be opened up to, to come and get a jab. And that in North Cumbria is about 24,000 um, kids. So quite significant. And then two other things to mention before I stop. One is there's been a significant increase in anti-vax activity across the country. And um, Cumbria Police have issued what's called Operation Lord at the moment. So um, there's some very coordinated anti-vax activity going on nationally. And it's culminating in three days. So three days of this week where the anti-vax groups are being asked to target some softer targets, i.e. those non-big vac centres. 
The Nightingale vaccination centre in Newcastle was closed down for an afternoon last week because a bus turned up with lots of anti-vaxxers on board who were threatening staff, etc. So we've we've made sure that all of our sites are aware that they have all the contact details for the for the local police and just to trigger the uh, Operation Lord um, scheme if if they needed to do that. And then the final thing is obviously now vaccinations as a condition of employment are going to be hitting us from the 1st of April, which means that those people who are frontline workers working with, with patients directly or indirectly um, need to have had their first vaccination by the 3rd of February. So that's a deadline that we're kind of working to at the moment. And we are making sure that we're coordinating our approach across North Cumbria to make sure all of the organisations are following the same HR processes with the same communications and the same outcomes if people choose not to have their vaccination. So that's the update, John. Thanks. Happy to take questions. Thank you there. Ed, I've got two, <coughs> two hands up that I can see. Denise first and then John. I think I probably echo everybody's thoughts. I think we should uh, minute a personal thanks to Ed for the leadership of this. I think it's been an absolutely phenomenal effort, um, but to pass it out to all the different teams and individuals involved. And they must be getting quite tired now, so it must be getting harder and harder to keep the momentum. I think in times when Cumbria or North Cumbria often doesn't come out great in the comparator stakes, it's just fabulous to see that we're up there. Um, certainly within the North East North Cumbria, but I know nationally as well. So yeah, it's just a massive thank you. Very sad that those people that are working so hard are getting targeted as well by the anti-vaxxers because that will make it more difficult. Thank, thank you, Denise. You. Thank you. John, uh, can, I, can I come back on one, John? Yeah, of course, can I come? Um, so, so first of all, very great big thanks, Denise. Thank you, thank you for that. Obviously, it's a huge, massive team effort. Um, social services, mental health trust, NCIC third sector, loads of volunteers, um, the list goes on and on. And for me, it's really demonstrated what's the art of the possible within North Cumbria with people pulling together. I think we forget often how good and how solid a lot of our relationships are between organisations um, compared to other areas. And I think that that's kind of played out as we've really pulled on everybody on the whole of society within North Cumbria over the last you know year and a bit. So, um, so yeah, I'll pass that on, but thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I'm going on to John, and then I, I have got you seen you now, Deb, so you'll be after John. But my point's pretty much the same as uh, uh, Denise's, actually. It's just, thank you. We've revisited this in the past. We've asked Ed to, 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 to thank the team for all their efforts, recognising they must be tired. I seem to recall Peter saying that uh, the best way the local population can thank the team is to get the vaccinations. It's sad to see that some don't. I'm sure Julie and her team are doing the best to do it. I have one bit of just a request, uh, Ed, just because I am a bit deaf, but more importantly, I've got a bad internet connection. Could you just repeat the bit about what's happening with five to 11 year olds? But that's not to detract from. Um, we need to keep a focus on the appreciation for the team. Um, as a governing body, perhaps in the development session, we need to think about how we can support and recognise that in, in, in some other ways, John. But that's not necessarily for the day. But yeah. could you just repeat the bit on the five to eleven year olds, please, Ed? Yeah. So, so at the moment, the, the five to eleven year olds who are clinically extremely vulnerable are going to be targeted first. So that's the first cohort of five to eleven year olds. So at the moment, we're looking at how we're going to vaccinate that group. But we're expecting very soon after that that all of the five to eleven year olds will be invited in, which is about twenty four thousand children. Um, We've not worked out yet who's going to do the vaccinations because the government has said it, it won't happen through schools. So at the moment, we're going out to primary care colleagues and community pharmacists to ask if they want to opt into these groups so that the, the jury's out at the moment in terms of whether whether we'll have enough vaccinators for these groups or not. So that's that's the work that we're currently doing. Thank you. Once again, great, great, grateful for everybody's efforts. And I think your comment there about how how do you recognise it's it's such a big team as well is is, is one that's well well made, John. And I, and I don't know the answer as to how to do that so you don't miss people, or how you hold an event or anything like that. And I'm and I'm not 100 percent certain, but I think it's something that needs to be discussed. Certainly, at a, potentially a Cumbria wide level or at least a North Cumbria wide level. Okay, um, Deb. 
Yeah, like Denise, I, I wanted to um, make sure that the thank you was, um, you know, definitely. And Carol's put something in the the chat. So, you know, that's all the lay members of the governing body that, you know, are really, really grateful for all you've done. But I think the other key thing to pick up on, Ed, is uh, the art of the possible, what's possible. And I think a lot of that is due to leadership, where you've got really good leadership, uh, which, Ed, you've demonstrated, then things are possible. Um, and I think both having received my own vaccinations and helped um, a couple of times with the process was that fantastic mix of professionals and professionals from lots of there's a whole bunch of firemen who were giving jabs, one of the sessions I went to, uh, and the volunteers. Um, and I think it's something for all our health and social care um, partners to take on board. Um, you know, I think particularly of um, the acute trust to, to sort of learn from that because it has been highly successful and much more successful than in other parts of the country. Um, and so it's a really good model for Cumbria, um, you know, and I think we need to make sure that we praise it, but also make sure that that benefit is carried on as we move to place base um, partway through the year, assuming that it does happen in July now, um, yeah. because it, it's been a great illustration, a sort of really good, um, you know, you would talk about using it as a case example. Um, and well done, Ed, and the, your whole team for what you've done. Well done. Yeah, thanks. Well said, Deb. I'm going to go back to yourself, Ed, before I bring Colin in, because I think you wanted to just maybe come back on that first and I'll bring Colin. Yeah, and um, so so at the moment, public health colleagues are phoning round individuals, all those individuals that haven't yet had their jab, just to say, can we check that you don't want your jab? And if so, are there any issues, you know, that are preventing you from having it? So everybody's being, being called who haven't yet had. We've, we've used the military, we've used the fire service, St John's Ambulance, um, but obviously the, the huge amount of work from our primary care teams and community pharmacies has, has, has been the kind of the, the, the backbone of the whole programme. So it's, yeah, it's been amazing. Thanks, Ed. Colin? John, it, it may be something that the Local Resilience Forum or something similar um, should take as a formal agenda item. Um, that um, since the vaccine programme was a true reflection of integrated community-wide working and that not only did it demonstrate the means by which we work together but um, it added great value to our resilience in mm -hmm. the face of the illness that there should be a consideration of a formal um, award to all those involved in if even if it's a virtual award uh, comes to mind things like um, places like the island of Malta was awarded the George Medal um, in the war, the whole of the island was awarded it. Um, same for the police force in Northern Ireland was awarded um, the George Medal. Um, and I think there there is something to be said to just say all of those involved uh, and again to, to lay it out and say we, we, we want to recognise it, plus with those stories. But I think it's something the Local Resilience Forum should actually think about when the, when things go well, when the, when local resilience is demonstrated, how does the Local Resilience Forum reflect that? Okay. Because you've got you to gotta recognise the good, haven't you? Absolutely, Colin. And yeah, OK, that's an that's a interesting point. Uh, Peter, obviously, you might want to add something to this before we finish this section. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, all of the all of the genuine messages of thanks uh, mm. are well given, well intentioned, well received. So I'm not I'm not going to echo them. Um, but I want I want to add a different kind of thanks. I think it's appropriate for us to do this as a governing body. So at the at the kind of at the kind of start of this, the, there were a number of key risks around the vaccine program. So one was about supply, and that's been up and down, and there've been some challenges in supply. But, um, you know, everyone's worked as hard as they possibly could with mutual aid, moving vaccine around and so on. But there was a supply challenge and, and a supply risk. There was definitely a capacity risk. Would we have sufficient resource to deliver the vaccine? And I think that's where everyone's thanking everyone for mobilising so fantastically and being organised with all of the partnership support to ensure that capacity. 
I think the third risk was that we would end up delivering this inequitably, unfairly. And there is no question that the, the burden of the pandemic has fallen much more heavily on more deprived communities. That's just an objective evidential statement. But I think in Cumbria, enormous work has been done to try to ensure that this was delivered equitably to all everyone who is eligible for the vaccine. And I think that that's a good piece of learning for the future about how we promote positively, actively, purposefully health equity as a, as a concept and a lived reality. But the last, the last big risk was about public support. And, you know, we, we rightly kind of uh, observe these kind of anti-vaccination campaigns and stuff. But we, that shouldn't detract from this programme could not be delivered if people did not come forward to receive the vaccine. And I think it would be appropriate in the right way, John, that our, our recorded thanks are actually extended to the public of North Cumbria who have participated in the programme and have been much more willing, actually, than many other areas to come forward. We've helped with that around the comms campaigns and so on, around making this more accessible geographically and so on. But I think it is appropriate um, in recording thanks that we extend those to the public. Very eloquently, succinctly and uh, skillfully put, Peter, for summary. Thank you very much for that. That's that's very useful. I just wanted to, to finish on one thing, and I don't want to go into great detail, but of course we know that in terms of health staff, as has happened to care staff, there is that requirement to have the vaccine for part of their work. Uh, and we know that that date is fast approaching. Whilst we don't, uh, she's, uh, you know, know the numbers 100%, I think for us, certainly in North Cumbria, certainly through the hospital, I think it's of potentially limited because a lot of people have had their vaccine. But uh, that will become much clearer because I know there's a lot of work going on for those that, for, for their own reasons and the things that they truly believe may, may well not want to do it. And we saw that item on the news, of course, didn't we, from the consultant when he, consult, when he confronted the, the health minister. So I say watch this space, but I, I'm not, I, I, having had sort of some initial conversations, I'm not unduly panicking at the moment of the potential impact of that. But at the same time, is it is something that is, is real, probably but less so here in North Cumbria. OK. I didn't want to go much further than that, but thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, I'm going to go on to item five. Um, decisions taken under emergency rules. This is normally a very short item, Charles. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be the same. Uh, well, I might actually disappoint you, John. Um, oh. <laughs> just just on that, it's, the, the, the substance of the item is as short as it has been every month that we uh, haven't taken or been required to take any such decisions. It did just strike me, uh, and I'm being totally opportunistic here, and perhaps should have mentioned it when we were looking at the minutes, is at the last governing body meeting, we extended the, the I'll call them the emergency governance arrangements to the end of March, given given where, where we were heading. But clearly, since then, uh, we're aware the CCG is going to continue uh, for a longer period. So, as I say, opportunistically, I'm not sure the principles on which we took that decision have changed. So, I just wondered if we wanted to, uh, as, a, as a default, continue with those to the end of June. It's just a, a thought. So, and, you, and you might not be think it's appropriate today, but I will. Okay. I mean, the thing is, we in terms of another governing body meeting, we do have one in March, do we not? Uh, if we need to do it formally. So we are covered up, up until that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, I, but therefore I, it's an aid memoir that we need to look yes, at it in March. We need to it's look at it in March. Even. Yeah, I was going to say that, that. That's, yeah, and I think, I don't think you'll be getting much resistance, but I just didn't think in terms of that governance side of things, we probably need to have it written down so that we can document it through a report rather than just a verbal update. But yeah, I think point well made, Charles. John, you wanted to make a point? Go on. It was just <clears throat> we know the life of the CCG is being extended for uh, ex mm. for circumstances. I just think it's more appropriate uh, to, to to confirm now. But that's my view. I'm happy okay. to be open, but I just think it takes a bit of bureaucracy from other people's lives okay. if we start that now, John. Okay. No, I mean I'm not going to be overly thing, but at the, the, the same time, is it'd be interesting to see whether actually how many 
decisions we've actually made and whether it's necessary. And that's why normally I, I don't think we've actually made any, to be fair, unless you tell uh, me otherwise. You're right. No, no, you're right. You're right. We haven't. Uh -huh. um, so it was just a. Just yeah, a OK. I, I think I think the re sorry John just to say on, the reason why I think we should consider it is that um, just to be aware as some of these things are, are happening regarding establishing the ICB and issues like that it might be useful to just have that at our disposal in case for argument's sake people are able to come to meetings or that sort of things as some of the the new responsibilities are coming through. So yeah. that that was the reason for wanting it just as a fail safe, okay. uh, as an insurance policy. OK, well, I, what I'll do is go with the first thing, except there may be differing views. We'll, we'll pend it till March and then we'll look at it then. And then just I, I don't think it's going to be a big issue is probably what I'm saying. OK, um, right. I'm going to move us on to uh, item six. Mark, you're going to take us through it. And, and obviously people have had the report to read in advance, but I'll, I'll hand over to you, Mark, for anything you want to pick up. Thanks, John. Um, I think the first thing to say is we've, we've actually picked up on quite a few of the things already that are in this report. So um, I won't cover over um, ground that we've already covered, but I think just to add my my thoughts also about, you know, the booster program and how fantastic it has been um, having uh, the benefit of working across a number of different CCGs. Um, I think it is really important just to note just how well we have done in Cumbria. Um, particularly given our geography and the kind of challenges that we've got. So it's absolutely right that we we give our thanks to Ed and also to the team and understand how we might take that, that action forward. Um, again, in terms of the pressures of services uh, or pressure on services, I think Peter um, has very clearly articulated where we are um, and some of the kinds of challenges that we have both had and continue to have at this point in time. Um, I think it's worthy of note um, that the impact on reducing staff availability, it's being felt across every sector across the, the ICS, and that's, that's uh, no different for ourselves uh, in North Cumbria. Um, and that is for everybody working in health, in care, in the hospital, in the community, mental health, primary care, ambulance. We can go on and on in terms of all of the areas of the service, but I think the, the effect has been felt across all the different sectors. And again, it's a testimony to to everybody who is working in this this challenging period of time that we've been managed that we've been able to continue the services that we have. Um, in terms of um, restrictions, um, obviously we, the things are emerging on a day by day basis in terms of Plan B and the easing of restrictions, etc. Um, I think the point has been made very well that we're we're not out of the woods yet and we're still moving through this. Um, we still need to be cognizant of that um, and still need to be um, very careful about the way that we uh, care for people, provide services um, and support our communities as we go through this. Um, and with all of those things, you know, again, our, our thanks go to everybody that's involved in all of these different um, areas as we continue to go through these challenges. Um, as we have moved through all these various different agenda items i think it's really important to remember that there are other things as well such as the flu vaccination program um and you've got some details in the report there about the uh vaccination program that's continued alongside um all of the covid work um and again the figures for um north cumbria are are very very impressive yet again and and you know that only adds to the to the sense of just how much time and effort colleagues are all putting into into these kinds of areas of work um, just turning our attention to a slightly different viewpoint, um, while all of this is going on, of course, we still have the work going on around the creation of the um, integrated care systems, the integrated care boards, etc. Um, that work continues. Um, we're looking forward to welcoming Sam Allen, um, who is the chief executive designate who will take up her post on the 31st of January um, to, to the northeast and North Cumbria. Um, and I think that that will be a really important step in terms of um, moving forward with the creation of the ICB and the ICS. Um, clearly, as, as, uh, as we've already mentioned, as John mentioned just earlier in the meeting, the timetable for the ICS creation has been put back to the 1st of July, um, primarily to ensure that there is the time and space to, 
to ensure that bills and acts um, are all of that work is completed through Parliament. Um, in one sense, um, that does take us back a little bit. Um, in another sense, there is the opportunity for us to continue all of this work to understand the detail, the depth of detail um, about what we need to understand about the ICB and its ways of working, and importantly, how the ICB will work at place. Um, and at this point in time, we've got um, the recruitment process is now live for the ICB board and the director and executive director posts in the board. That process went live on the 23rd of December. Um, the recruitment uh, window for applications for the finance director, the medical director, the nursing director and the director of systems uh, strategy and, uh, uh, and development those closed on the 30 uh, sorry on the 17th of january the rest of the posts the process for application will close on the 31st of january and while that has been going on um, in parallel there has been um, a staff consultation process going on with all of those members of governing bodies who are affected by the establishment of the icb so we continue to work through those things um again as, as sam comes on board towards the end of the month um, we're expecting that we'll be able to move forward with very many things in terms of detail, not least in terms of things like delegation and how that how we will work with um, uh, place. Um, it's also the case um, since we last met that um, discussions with local authority colleagues and the NHS were continuing in terms of the integrated care partnerships. Um, and I think that's that's welcome having got to a point now where the expectation is that, that we will have an integrated care partnership board that covers the whole of the North Cumbria Northeast ICS, but there will also be sub boards as well. And they, we work in the expectation that there will be four sub boards, uh, one in North Cumbria, one in the north, one in the centre of the ICS and also one in the south. Um, and the, the understanding about how that will work will all be part and parcel, we expect, of that discussion with Sam and the ICB about how how the whole of the ICS will work with place, which of course North Cumbria is uniquely positioned because we are a, a, an area in our own right, um, an integrated care partnership um, currently in our own right, but we are also a place in terms of the definitions that have been discussed um, around the development of the ICS. Just final couple of points, um, update on the planning process and the national priorities. So we're starting our process of planning for 2023 and we've had the publication of the 10 priorities and the, the guidance from NHS England. Um, we're working towards um, draft plans that need to be um, delivered in mid-March and, and final plans towards the end of April. And of course, that will take us on into the new year and those first three months of the CCGs working to deliver those to be picked up then by the ICS and the ICB. Um, in terms of local government reform, um, works going ahead um, on the uh, elections uh, in terms of, of spring and May for the two shadow authorities, which will replace our current seven local authorities in Cumbria. Uh, and there is a website where you have a link uh, where there are updates and more information can be can be found about that. Um, final point, um, really important point this, um, the importance of information shared by the NHS. Um, Ipsos Mori have shared information that, that ranks the top 20 organisations and their share of online the audience. Um, it was published in November and it puts the NHS at number seven just behind the BBC. So it really shows um, a growth in our audience. 2.7% showing the NHS on online information reached 37 million people. Um, that's around 75% of UK internet users over five. Um, and it just does show the importance of information. It shows the importance of the NHS as a trusted source of information, um, and in particular, re providing reliable local information to our communities about health and healthcare services, uh, and COVID in particular. So, John, I will stop there and very happy to answer any questions. Um, of course, there may be some items that you might want to add to that. OK, thanks, Mark. I, I wasn't going to add anything because I know I've had different briefings with different people at different times on some of these issues. But is there, if there's anything that anybody wants to ask or pull out, because it's quite a lot of structural stuff there. Uh, and I know we've talked about services. 
But uh, was that yourself, Carol? I saw I saw something come up. There you go. There, you, there is it. That's it. Got you. Go on. Uh, th thanks, Mark. I, I really ought to know the answer to this. I feel a bit daft asking, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, can you possibly explain the um, the diff the potential differences between the four sub boards and the eventual designation of the places? So will there be like one place for each sub board or some sub boards will have more places? Um, I'm a bit a little bit confused about that. Right. OK, so so we're still so the short answer is we're still working through some of that detail. But as we are, as we understand it at the moment, we we've got we've got our four areas that we work in at the moment and that the structure, I guess, of the of the sub boards of the integrated care partnership, they're expected to follow that those same kind of geographical areas. So that that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is why we're unique in North Cumbria is we are we are a place and one area and those two things are are, are synonymous and coterminous with, with one another but it's different in the other three areas so for instance in the north where I always where I, where I also work um, that area is covered by um, what will be for the expectation be four places so one place is Northumberland another North Tyneside another Newcastle and another Gateshead um, and it's similar in the centre, where the South Tyneside, Sunderland and Durham, similar in the in, t in the Tees Valley area, where there are five areas there and five local authorities. Does, does, does that answer your question? It does, but therefore it sounds like we're more or less definitely going to be a place because there's no point in having a sub board with no place to go underneath it, right? So so that's the expectation. Yeah. But I, but I'll just caveat that by saying when Sam Gums comes on board, we want to need to have the discussion with Sam about what the aspiration is for place and how place works. And, and place means slight. It means something slightly different in each of those four areas. You know, the Tees Valley area, Sunderland, the north and ourselves. And I think that we need to work through those things with Sam as we understand how Sam and, and colleagues coming together in the ICB would like uh, the ICB to work. And, and just to add a little bit to that, Carol, the responsibilities of integrated care partnerships under the Health and Care Act are very are quite specific around des designing a strategy and, and monitoring the strategy. And the, so, so that there are some specific things similar to the roles of the integrated care board. OK, so that's two things. So it's it's. It's not as easy at the moment, I think, for other areas. I think it's slightly easier for us to see where that might end up. But when asked the question at a recent meeting, uh, as Sam's arriving, is Sam has not got any fixed views at the moment about what this would be. And I think that's a fair assessment for her. Uh, there has been some work done it centrally, but that work has never been disputed in a way that said it will be this, it will be this, it will be this. So one of the anxieties I think that we all had if we were moving towards the 1st of April was we are unclear and very concerned about the development of place and what it might mean or not. So I think now with the extra time, it gives us some space to do that. So that's probably where we are. And, and rest assured, I know that Mark is and, and I am just trying to work out what that actually means for us. Uh, when I want to say us, I mean us in North Cumbria and the partners in North Cumbria and how that fits in within the wider ICS framework. So we, we, we're making those connections. So it's watch this space, I suppose. And I think it's only a, a week or two before Sam comes. So I'm going to go to John first and then I'm going to go to Colin. Uh, thanks, thanks, John. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that. That was very, very helpful and detailed. And I suppose it's just to build on the um, the, the, the the point that uh, we made, and it's it's, it's almost a bookmark point. Um, we we left the last point about uh, Charles and the delegated responsibility for executive decisions for particular things um, to the next governing body. But at the same time, uh, I think it's just responsible for us to note that. We are confirmed as, uh, as declining on the 30th of June at the moment. We enter a period of purda. There's a lot of political uh, speech marks instability at the moment. And I think it's just important that as a governing body, we record 
that we're on our toes in terms of being able to respond to any guidance and make sure that whatever changes, we try to mitigate the effects on on the patients in North Cumbria. And it was just basically to, to, to record that in, in our minutes. Thanks, John. Colin? Um, I suppose this is an appendum to the question that Carol asked in the sense that it's good we're making this progress in being clear about these things and every clarity we can get is good. But when you actually start to take it apart a little, there there is no as yet sure way that these constructs are, for instance, um, made substantive. So for instance, if I was to take the idea of what we've just talked about and said, what would the clinical input to that look like? Well, that would be a highly complex thing to talk about. And we can't talk about it here because it's so complex. So people shouldn't project, I think, in assumptions that um, because we're a place based, we're going to look like what we look like now. It's not at all clear exactly how things will work out. And it, it and, and really, if we're not careful, we get very anxious and worried about that. But there will be or there will have to be a process by which we work through that. And I think that's what I'd be saying at the end of this is, although I'm pointing this out, what I'm basically going to say then is that we've got to fully engage with the process by which Sam, the team, the, the organisation um, make sure that whatever way and we're going to work in these subgroups that they're properly supported and we can do the work that we have to do. And there is a heck of a lot of jumping up and down to be done about that, folks, um, because if we set up these um, 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 structures uh, and have great hopes for them, well, those, those hopes will only be recognised if it's properly set up, as we all know. So I'm just kind of saying that there's a lot of there's a lot of a journey still to be done, Carol, to bottom out what it actually means. And, and, and I'm saying that in a positive sense, not in a negative one. Thanks very much. Thanks, Colin. Denise, and then we'll we'll move on. But go on. I think I just want to say I'm glad that Mark's put that bit at the bottom of his report, or both of your report, on the NHS and information. Because so much of our time at the moment and all of your time as exec goes on um the bigger things the bigger system the bigger structures the icbs ics's but actually if we forget the cons that needs to go along with it we lose so much of what we've gained in north cumbria and there's lots of examples in this governing body both part one and two of where comms has played such a massive role including the vaccine program so yeah let's just keep on with the good work that julie's team does um during all these much much bigger structural changes well said, Denise. And there you go, Julie. You can take that as a compliment. Excellent. OK, I'm Paul, by the way, if you're still here. All right, uh, let's move on. I'm going to now we're on to an item of business, as it were, in terms of decision making. So, Charles, I'm going to ask you to take us through anything you want to pick out for the governing body assurance framework. So ho hopefully, thanks, John, I will be relatively uh, brief on uh, on this particular item. Uh, governing body members may recall um, it's probably going on uh, a couple of years ago uh, it was flagged by our internal audit colleagues that uh, we hadn't really done a great deal of work to uh, refresh some of our governance arrangements some of it as uh, covid came along was almost suspended because of other other pressures but nevertheless we did quite a lot of work last year uh, to establish a, a governing body assurance framework uh, change the focus of how we did things so it went through the exec which it's done again here uh, we've had a refresh of the risk register that's been to finance and performance uh, so this is this is something uh, that is a business as usual thing that we uh, we should be doing uh, until now the 30th of, of june it's therefore important we continue to to do our business as best we can but not necessarily in a vacuum because we know that's coming uh, but at the same time uh, as we've touched on before part of the role of the ccg is we 
transfer, transform across these structures is to ensure we we provide what's called due diligence checklist or information about all material issues um, in the CCG so that those taking over formal statutory responsibility in the future have got an eye on those. So as well as doing it for the here and now, it was a useful thing, thing to do. So we refreshed the risk register, uh, the exec looked at all the issues that came up there. We also looked what was already on our assurance framework and the view was basically uh, all the things were being that were flagged on the risk register were already covered within those wider strategic risks or were quite operational in nature so you wouldn't need to to put them on. There were a couple of issues that uh, came up we thought we should take a watching brief on. One, uh, the infection prevention and control to a degree is probably linked to, 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 to the COVID and, and, and that sort of thing. But the other, the, the new item was definitely as the additional roles uh, come out that are nationally funded in primary care, that is actually expanding uh, the workforce in primary care. So do these people, if they're going to do an effective job, uh, have, have somewhere to work? Um, it's fair to say at this moment in time, it's a bit of a grey area to say the least in terms of uh, the GP premises directions, in terms of are we able to fund these? Are we not? If we even if we had the money money to do it, um, I think the view was we take a watching brief on it. But just to say, uh, we, we're not not being proactive on this. So we are having uh, a number of discussions with some of the PCNs who flagged that this is an issue uh, to see how we can how we can uh, address this. And I think it's it, it's probably fair to say. It's not just about necessarily uh, building more more space. It's how do we make best use of our space? How would we potentially look at changes in working practices that have perhaps developed uh, through the pandemic? And if we're looking at combining things across a primary care network that includes a number of practices, is there scope to sort of mix and match and, and do things in a slightly different way to, to address this. But nevertheless, it, it, it's an issue in North Cumbria, it's an issue uh, in the North East, North Cumbria, and it's an issue across the country. So we need to, we, we need to have a look at that. Um, the same token, we looked at what was on the big strategic risks and uh, I think the general view, and I'm sure governing body members would support this given the sorts of things that we talk at many times at this and our other committees that we uh, we we did make a change there the final thing just to say the completeness is the reason uh, as with last year we haven't got covid and the response to that the, the the pandemic on there as a specific risk because we are managing it as a specific item it's always up front and centre of these meetings, what the big issues are, how we're dealing with them. And it, it, you could say it doesn't need to be said that it's a big risk, but it is a big risk. But it's such a big risk, we, we felt it was over and above um, that, that, that structure that we have there. So don't really want to say a lot more about it, John, but that, that's where we are. But hopefully it gives governing body members an update that we have gone through uh, uh, a proper process to do this uh, and we have properly considered it and that's recorded in the executive minutes. Thank you so much Charles and thank you for all the work that I know a lot of people have done on this uh, to get to this stage. So Carol, going to go to you first. Um, thank you very much. Thanks Charles for uh, the overview and it, it, it you know it's a it's a very effective and relevant and useful um, you know, piece of work, and it's good to see that we've we've updated it. The only comment I had was, I was wondering under the um, strategic objective on the third page, we build health and care services around our local communities. If we've adequately mentioned the needs of different types of communities, so people of different ethnicity, 
um, uh, sexuality, um, people with disabilities. Um, we've we've mentioned issues relating to poverty there a little bit in, uh, about car ownership and so and I'm just wondering here if we have effectively enough um, reflected the needs of the different types of communities that we have. Um, I know that's a big ask and it may be that not you know you can't mention I, everything but yeah I just just a thought Charles. I think I think um, the the way which might not be uh, perhaps adequate, adequately covered in, in this document is um, one of our system priorities is looking at uh, looking at population healthcare, population healthcare management, looking at addressing inequalities and, and those sorts of things. So I think it's it, it's covered there. I mean the, the fundamental risk is are we are, are we fulfilling that objective? I think what we've started to do through some of those means is identify ways of mitigating those risks and seeing that we're doing them. And as Ed said earlier, in terms of the, the biggest single risk we, we face, which is, uh, and Peter did too, which is the impact of the pandemic. We have actually been very proactive in identifying those hard to find communities. So people recall, for example, uh, we took a mobile vaccination unit to Appleby Horse Fair as, as, as an example. And, and there are a number of areas uh, like, like this. Uh, and I think it's something we need to work, work with. And I think as we move forward, that sense of place and the sort of strategy working with the local authority that Mark's mentioned very much needs to uh, understand its local population so we can plan and strategize uh, in an appropriate level reflecting those those needs. Okay, well, point well raised, Carol. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to pass to Ed. Thanks, John. Yeah, and just, just to build on what Charles was saying, I mean, I think we're at a, a critical point in terms of the system with where we are with ICC. So there was the value for money paper that, that Peter's obviously written and, and it's going through all organisations. In fact, I think we're talking about it later. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a really critical point for the system because, you know, I do believe that if we are building those health and care services around local communities, then, you know, my and probably a lot of other people's views are ICC is quite critical to that in terms of bringing all those organisations together, concentrating on the here and the now, but also the upstream population health management as well. So I think, um, yeah, that, that a really good kind of opportunity we've got to, to build further on ICCs. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Are there any other comments or questions in relation to what we're being asked to do or the document? Who wants to raise? OK, right. OK, ba based on that, we are asked to approve this particular document. Obviously, it's been through the executive as well. Uh, so I need a proposer and a seconder, and then obviously if there's any disagreement on that. So anybody who wants to propose it, please. Uh, John, thank you. I've got that. John Whitehouse as a proposer. Seconder, Denise, got that. And I take it everybody else is comfortable. Yeah, OK. Thank you for that. Thanks for the work as well on that, as I said before, Charles. So that's good. Now, the next items we've got are either for information. Um, but I think we've got to start with item number eight, which I, I do believe we have a, a colleague with us, Molly. Yeah, to talk about the Cumbria Safeguarded Adults Board annual report where we, we are asked to receive it. But I don't know if Molly, if there's anything else you wanted to read. Are we going to go straight to you or through Louise? Is it? Is it straight to Molly? Yeah, thank you, John. Um, obviously, I was just yeah. going to introduce Molly. Um, I know most of you um, have, have, have come across Molly, but Molly's our designated nurse for safeguarding um, and has kindly um, agreed to join us today just to give us the highlights um, of the report. So thank you. And I will hand over to Molly. Thanks, John. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. Um, so people have had this uh, report, which is now published on the Cumbrian Safeguarding Adults Board um, website. It's a 26 page document divided into uh, sections 14 and there's uh, the usual suspects in here describing who our partners are and um, how we're working together. And I just want to pull a few bits out of the, uh, the report to highlight based upon my experience of what people want to know. So um, one of the most important concepts of adult safeguarding 
which differs very different to um, children's safeguarding, is making safeguarding personal because people have got their rights um, on one part of the balances and their choices, um, which some people might find unwise. So one of the uh, tools used by the board and partners, just to take a little window into that, is to ask people at the onset of any safeguarding concern, what is it that you want from this? And then they monitor that during the journey and they ask them at the end, you know, did we meet your needs? Were they partially met, fully met or not met at all? So I'm glad to highlight that 13.27 uh, were not met, but actually 49% were partially met, which is, I think, um, a reality across the country of where people are um, triggering um, procedures for that person in their best interests. And they're not fully understood by the individual at the centre of that where they may conflict and think that this isn't what they want. Great examples are contained in the report in the format of some um, case studies. Um, and 37% thereabouts were thought to be met. Um, and obviously that is a um, key component that will be is visited all the time by the board and by the practitioners who are uh, working within the frameworks. Um, another highlight I would uh, again numerical, not my um, my strongest point, but uh, 1,865 referrals were looked at during this year of 2020 to 21, which is a, a huge number. Um, 259 was still open at the end of that year, and sometimes that's because they're open to other concurrent processes, such as um, our partners, the police. Um, but there are systems and processes um, in place to look at that. In terms of um, themes and categories, um, interestingly, for adult safeguarding, physical abuse was the highest category, closely dovetailed with emotional abuse. And you can imagine um, why there is that strong linkage. Um, in terms of who's using um, these uh, policies and procedures, um, social care were the highest um, referrer in, 33% of them, followed very closely by 32% in health. So it tells me that um, procedures are being used, people do know what the signs and symptoms are, and they are sharing that in an effective way. That's all outlined for more detail on page 18. Um, I think that uh, the four subgroups um, are outlined. Again, um, they are a, um, a regular feature of every board, learning and development, performance and quality. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the SAG group before I conclude and comms and engagement. And I know that we have um, Julie um, on the call today, who's um, a very effective uh, member of that group on behalf of the CCG. And she also links into all of the other subgroups because she cascades the learning that is coming out of the serious adult reviews, um, what we refer to as SARS, and she cascades uh, learning events with her team, such as the national safeguarding, but also partner events, and she does that really effectively. She works with our team and supports Mandy within primary care and the um, the core elements of our team um, to keep our websites up to date, both for us as internal customers, but also public facing. I know we heard about engagement earlier. It's really important that um, we get that, the information in a format, which is uh, Julie's team's expertise, that the public can understand so they know what to be concerned, what a concern is, how to raise it, how to follow that up, who to contact for advice, whether that's professionals and partners or whether that's the general public. Um, so I'll conclude um, by um, saying that I'll take any questions at all, um, just in terms of uh, time. Thank you, Molly. And uh, obviously we, we welcome this report and obviously it's overview and the partnership and everything that you've talked about there, which is part of what we've been talking about today as well, in terms of how partners have worked effectively together. But I've got some questions. I'll go, I'll go in the order uh, of Denise, Mandy and then Deb. That's okay. 
Thanks, Molly. It's a really good report. And I know it's really hard when you are coordinating between so many different organisations to get something that's succinct, gets everything in um, and does what it says on the tin. And for me personally, it helped me understand about what making safeguarding personal is all about. I think the statement in your case study um, about it means seeing the world is not black and white really hammers home when you read about that person's story in there. So yeah, thank you. It makes a lot of understanding. And it fits very much with the next page where your objective, which I would always support, obviously, in my role is ensuring the voice of the service user is heard, because without doing that in that case study, you really wouldn't have got the result that they wanted. And it's quite poignant listening to it. And my other point is, as you'd expect, um, Obviously, the comms is great looking at the numbers there and how they've increased over the time. Love the fact that the top tweet is your vaccine easy read stuff for, for learning disabilities, which is fantastic. And when I've seen other stuff with the comms for the easy read, they're really poignant again, really important. So thank you. Thank you, Denise. I think there's a note in there to say that they've reached 19,000 during that year um, of briefings, which is just astonishing. It is. Excellent. Well said, thank you. So, Mandy. Yeah, thanks, Molly. So, so, no questions from me. Because obviously, um, we work very closely as a team, don't we, in, on, on this agenda. Um, just to kind of build on what Molly was saying there, I think, um, I'm not sure whether governing body members will be aware, but um, obviously you'll, you'll definitely have heard of health pathways. So we do now have a suite of really good safeguarding pathways as well, which our GPs and community colleagues are using. I even had a, a meeting recently with the CNTW manager and they all love health pathways and they're using those. So I was signposting her to say, you know, let your staff have a look at our safeguarding pathways because they're more than welcome to use those as well. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of flag that because it's a great piece of work that we've done alongside Georgina Coakley, who's one of Helen's clinical editors. Um, obviously, as a team, what we are seeing is definitely an increase in adult safeguarding cases. So Molly and I sit on various panels now for domestic homicide reviews, for safeguarding adult reviews, where things have sadly gone very wrong. Um, but I think it's fair to say, Molly, that as well as they, they definitely bring up a lot of learning around where things have gone wrong as a system, but they also bring up for us some really good examples as well of good practice that's going on. And that always gives us a bit of a, a, a boost, doesn't it, Molly? It always heartens us that actually there's a lot of really good work going on out there. I think personally going forward, what we're really going to find a challenge as a health and care system is if you're going to be able to personalise um, care um, properly and effectively and, and take those people, those really vulnerable people along with you, continuity of care is really important. And I think the way that we're talking about the challenges that we have in our current workforce, that's going to be a huge challenge, challenge for us as we go forward. And it's something that I'm constantly reminded of when I'm talking to GP colleagues it's those that have really put some time aside to build that trusted relationship with those vulnerable adults and really work alongside them to find out a way forward that keeps them safe and keeps them well. That's the, that's where you see successes. But that's getting more and more challenging as our workforce becomes more and more diverse. So it's something we'll need to be very mindful of as we go forward. But thanks, Brian Morley, for the report. Thank thanks you. Thanks for that. Thanks for that overview as well, Mandy. That was very useful. Uh, Deb? Yeah, thanks very much, Molly. Um, I was just going to repeat what others have said about um, the fact that it is such a succinct um, report. I think it's really clear. Um, it, I like the visuals as well. <laughs> um, and I think uh, to, just to go back to that thing about the personal safeguarding, that if we can make safeguarding personal, we, you know, we can learn a lot about general health issues make them personal um so not you know what is the matter with you but what matters to you um and if we can get that message right across the system uh then that will probably get better outcomes as you've found in your safeguarding so again thank you very much to your team and the adult safeguarding team um i realize it is very different from children's safeguarding <laughs> <laughs> okay thank, thanks for that deb Anything else from anybody? OK, we, we are just asked to receive this report um, uh, as, as obviously as a statutory organisation who is a key partner within the safeguarding framework for adults. So are we ha happy to just receive the report and we'll move on? Yeah. OK, thank you for your comments and thank you, Molly, as well, 
for giving the the overview and the report um and really appreciate your time so thanks so much you can stay if you want because it's a public meeting but you might have other more important things to do you're all right I yeah. okay meetings. all right <laughs> okay everybody. thank Bye you bye-bye bye-bye um just item nine moving on uh peter's just going to give us a quick verbal update on these two issues in relation to health inequities uh what about cumbria and lancashire equity commission and the North East and north cumbria ics health equalities i'll be be really brief um chair so i think many of you know that the south cumbria and lancashire integrated care system requested um sir michael marmot to lead what they termed a health equity commission for Lancashire and South Cumbria. <clears throat> and in the late autumn, um, following a request through Cumbria County Council, it was agreed that that uh, commission would extend to cover all of Cumbria, i.e. would include North Cumbria too. Um, the commission is kind of taking the process of receiving evidence um, from a wide range of stakeholders, including from each health and wellbeing board area and also from each local place based partnership. Um, I think I think, Chair, we would have said in the past ICP, but that becomes confusing language, doesn't it? So place based partnerships. Um, Cumbria Health and Wellbeing Board did submit evidence. Um, Dr Patterson and I with um, really great input from Leslie Jones, public health consultant host at NCIC and Lisa Gibbons from NEX, um, participated in presenting to the commission sometime in November. The commission is due to report in March. <coughs> um, I don't know if I should be saying this, but I'm gonna. Um, we, we have the annual Lock in the Lake organised by Click, and we expect that um, Sir Michael Marmot will, will address that meeting as well. Um, so uh, I'll put, put that in your diary from May the 17th, I think is the date, so, so hold that off. And there are now draft um, recommendations which have been released for consideration from, from that commission. Um, John, you'll know you you were one of the people who heard the presentations and were part of the panel that received the the various bits of evidence. Um, I think there are largely two things that have kind of emerged. One um, are all of the broader social determinants of health, which are by far the biggest and most impactful uh, long term long term uh, indicator of health outcomes. The second, very strongly prompted by Dr. Patterson, is that the NHS could, should, and hopefully will do much better about delivering services fairly, promoting health equity, and reversing what is termed the inverse, the inverse care law. So that, that was a strong feature of our submission. Um, I think the second thing that you mentioned, John, the North Eastern North Cumbria ICS held a health inequalities summit meeting, I think attended by 316 people online. I think it was 316, a lot of interest. On the 6th of December, um, some really good inputs. Um, St Liam Donaldson, the uh, current chair of the ICS, um, addressed the meeting. Um, some really uh, fascinating inputs from some specific services. Um, the If you've never taken an interest in the substance misuse agenda, just listen to the gentleman talking about the impact of street heroin use in Middlesbrough. It will make you cry. Um, and a really great input at the end from uh, one of the national directors for NHS England responsible for promoting equity, who's also a GP in North Derbyshire. Um, if anybody hasn't had a chance to view it, it is available. Uh, Julie will be able to circulate the link and helpfully it does give you the timings of when each speaker began. And hopefully, hopefully, Chair, what all these things are indicating is that particularly for the new ICB as an organisation, we can really, really take much more seriously the whole issue of promoting health equity, uh, promoting fairness and simply doing the right thing, rather than some of the other performance measures which typically capture more attention. Um, my own view is if we can't shift the dial on, on fairness, 
on equity, on population health, then um, what are we doing, really? Um, I will stop there. Hopefully that gives a, a, a reasonable overview. Excellent, Peter. Thank you for that. And I'm just going to sh shift to Colin. Um, John, if, if anybody does have the time to watch those video presentations um, about parts in particular of Lancashire, um, um, I would uh, prepare yourself um, for some harrowing um, um, personal testimonies and in particular for witnessing um, um, one of the ministers just weeping, um, devastating, um, um, as he is um, assailed in his ministry in his area, um, reduced to tears. And I think that um, one of the things I would want to, apart from the devastation of just acknowledging the sheer inhumanity of it, um, and hearing Professor Marmont's words echo in your ears, that the inequalities in our country, north to south, are of the same size as those was present um, when the Berlin Wall came down and they tried to unify East and West Germany. Just we didn't need well, we didn't need communism and capitalism having a bit of a scrap in the Cold War. We did it all ourselves. Hooray for us. And by that, I mean me. I mean Colin. Patterson as part of the body politic, as part, uh, as, as, as a citizen, as a fellow citizen. Um, it just beggars belief. Um, and I suppose in, in the end, um, I'm kind of hinting folks, there needs to be some sort of social movement, not only social movements as Andy Knox talks about him, our colleague Andy Knox, from South Cumbria who speaks about producing social movements within communities so we don't do it to communities but actually communities are enabled to do it for themselves. I'm very keen that we start to ask the question about what is it that we can do to help you within your communities make this journey. Very keen on that and also about describing and one of the inputs that I put in is what is a good life? What is a good life lived? What does it mean? Um, um, because I think if we don't have that narrative as well, what what is it that we're on this journey to? And that, of course, um, to put it very um, 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 sort of distinctly, is the best life that we can live, not only for ourselves, but our families and our communities, maximising that which we can do best for ourselves and everybody else, which sounds like um, um, apple food, uh, 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 apple pie and motherhood, but it, it's fundamentally a requirement for us to be clear about um, the fact that this is something that can be applied if you live in an urban area, a rural area, whether you want to be a plumber, whether you want to be um, 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 a university lecturer. It's something that we can all journey together, whether you happen to be fully able, whether you happen to um, have um, challenges in your life about how your physical life uh, is is lived that we can all aim to be the best that we can that we can be. So um, there, there is there is that and looking very much forward to Professor Marmot's report challenging that it will be and the fact that we not only have to do it in our communities within our structures but we have to start I'm afraid John being probably a little controversial now political we have to start to campaign on these things because it's become clear to me, I'm afraid that levelling up is only going to happen if those who need levelled up jolly well jump up and down and shout about it a lot. That's that's the fundamentals here, folks. It's very, very frustrating. You would hope that if somebody promised you levelling up, that 
bleep bleep the liver on leveling up but that's not uh, seemingly mr gove looking at it now maybe we can hope that Miss, Mr. Gove or somebody else will actually start doing some of this levelling up stuff. But I suppose the call here is, John, that between our ICSs, and maybe we're the link pinch here, John, maybe, maybe, maybe we can help with this, and I know I bring it up every chance I get. We have to not only campaign within our ICSs at a political level for levelling up, but we have to join together as ICSs as probably the greater north um, cooperative, and I'm, I'm sure that John and Mark, you'll be speaking to Sam Allen about this. It's it's all well and good saying that we're going to campaign for the northeast, but it's not big enough. Not even at the biggest ICS in the country is big enough for this. It's got to be the greater north, and in particular, John, for us, we do have a, a, a very. And I only bring this in at the end because I think that we have to have big hearts in this. But I think we also, even with Core Twenty Plus Five, which we talked about. Uh, you might remember a few minutes ago, uh, um, and even though that being inculcated and being the way forward for us to do it, which I fully support, um, we have to realise that we've got a, a particular problem in North Cumbria. Because our challenge population and our affluent population kind of cancel each other out, when you compare us to Lancashire, I'm um, part of the uh, difficult parts of the North East, like say Middlesbrough, we can get lost. And so, John, we have to think of our very little bit of narrative that doesn't drown out the needs um, of the, the, the great heartbreaking inequalities and injustices that there are, but also say, but don't forget about our coastal communities. We, you know, we just have enough misery to be below the radar, but we're still here and we need something that's just right for us. Um, um, and I, I think, John, that, that that's the kind of um, uh, being there, being involved in these discussions, seeing when things are absolutely eye-wateringly horrible, and yet still keeping that narrative that these coastal communities in particular, uh, um, uh, and the, 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 the sort of challenge there is in, in our part where it, the, the data gets cancelled out because we have uh, affluent areas that, that are doing well. Thank goodness somebody's doing well out of this. I include myself in that, by the way. I, I live in an affluent area. I'm I'm doing all right uh, in, in, in the sense of my life experience. We just got to admit that. That's one of the problems is that many of us are doing okay. Um, but we've got to keep that ability to have a really good, strong narrative about our coastal communities and our challenge communities. So hopefully uh, folks will um, want to join in even as uh, we make this transition by making sure that the continuity of these conversations is kept. And I know it's close to your heart, John, uh, and I'm sure, Mark, you're also only too aware of some of those areas in Gateshead and in um, Newcastle, uh, and that how also they vary in, in some of their conversations with some of the more affluent areas of the uh, of Northumberland and some of the coastal bits that are also there in um, some of the uh, old mining towns and such like. So, uh, well, thanks for listening as, as Dr. Patterson went on a little rant. <laughs> no, thank you, Colin, in terms of the passion. And obviously, as a health inequality lead in, in that respect, you are entitled to sort of outline sort of the things and, and influences in that way. But yes, I think absolutely there's, there's, there's work to do. Uh, just um, before I bring you back in, Denise, uh, I just wanted to say, just in terms of some key key figures, and just so everybody else knows, as, as Peter outlined, I am on that sort of health equity commission as a panel member, and there's some there's a meeting on the 24th of the first, which is about the findings and the analysis, and then there's a meeting on the 21st of February, which is about receipt of, of the full report and recommendations, which then links into what Peter said about receipt of that report for us, and I think it's um, going to be something that we we do need to progress, and I think people's passion about this, which obviously Peter outlined as well, and support of this is really, really important. And I think it is a wider discussion than just, oh, if we do this, this will happen. It's a, this, this is a long term issue, a long term issue. Denise, I'm going to let you have the, the final question or comment on this, and then we're going to shift on to the other items. Yeah, just so I was one of the 300 odd who went to that summit. It was one of the best that I've ever been to. Um, and I totally applaud what what Collins just said. We've got we've also got so much passion for tackling these health inequalities here. Whatever happens with place, we've got to gather that together and make it go forward. And I do think just within our own 
IPS designate, we've got to get our voice raised as well, because the only sadness on that health summit is there were no services from Cumbria represented. And I know that we're doing such fantastic work and we need to get that out there. We mustn't get left behind in the whole North East North Cumbria positioning. Fair so, point. No, no, that's a fair point. Got that. OK. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for that. And um, we're, we're going to we are going to move on because I'm just conscious of the time as well. We do have three items here, which obviously have been through various committees as well, but we're going to take them in order. I'm going to deal with the quality report, first of all. And, and Louise, anything that you want to say? And obviously, Carol might want to join in as well, but I'll, I'll pass over to you first, Louise. Thanks, John. So um, obviously, just I suppose in the same vein as the conversations already today, the quality dashboard obviously reflects the period ending quarter three. Um, and as with the, the performance report that's due to come, um, doesn't reflect the significant impact of the ongoing community transmission of Omicron, uh, predominantly in the health and uh, social care workforce, as Peter mentioned before. So I think the challenges identified um, in the dashboard, um, unfortunately, have over in, only intensified. Um, and so, for example, in respect to NCIC, um, again, as already mentioned, the high level of uh, medically optimised patients in particular. Um, obviously, there were some areas um, of, of improvement uh, noted in the report around RTT, the two week cancer waits and the 52 weeks waiters. But again, obviously, um, the next report will be able to provide that current position in terms of the impact. Similar again, obviously, in relation to CNTW, in relation to again, what was some um, encouraging um, <clears throat> work against the performance standards. So um, it's that point, you know, I think as we start to experience the fall in um, rates and focus on again, um, exhausted workforce, I think there are some immediate considerations about our ongoing management of risk and safety, which is very much in our mind across the health and care sector. Um, but clearly, um, again, in terms of that forward view is understanding in terms of the impact of harms, um, including that sort of shift in care that we've had um, as services have responded differently during the pandemic and, and how that needs to feed into our recovery plans um, just means we very much need to think about that wraparound support. I'm not sure we've mentioned waiting well today, but that's obviously one of the areas um, as well as learning. Um, I know, Suzanne, you're on the call, did a lot of work um, in terms of the learning after wave one, um, because all these things, we need to be able to harness the improvements to reduce what will be um, a legacy burden of poor health. And that obviously links in back again to the conversation we've just had about the focus on population and inequalities because all of that will mean that there will be improvements in the quality and safety of care that we deliver. So unless there's any um, specific questions around what's in the dashboard, um, or Carol, I don't know if you want to add anything, um, I'll leave it there, John, thanks. Uh, yes, just to come in, thanks very much, Louise. Um, we did uh, consider this report in some detail um, at our recent um, uh, Quality and Outcomes Committee um, last week. Um, one of the key areas that we discussed was the the um, imbalance in the system with having so many people that are fit to be discharged in hospital. I think it was something in the range of over 100. And yet the difficulties we're having in um, patients being uh, in A&E for a very long time, the lack of available beds to admit patients and then the knock on effect on the ambulance service and so on. And the, in effect, the whole system. Um, is really, really struggling. And then if you add that, the, the ongoing staff problems, which others have outlined of up to 10% of staff not being able to come to work at the moment, some of them actually well, but having to isolate. Um, and so, um, you know, we were reassured that we're doing a lot as a system and as a CCG to look at the whole, if you like, pathway of patients coming in and out of the hospital. But we are still in this very, very stretched bordering on crisis, I think, position with having so many patients unable to come out of hospital. Uh, so, you know, there is a lot of work. The, 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 the exec team are on this, I know. Um, and I'd just like to say, as you know, the lay member, I appreciate all the work and the effort that's ongoing, but we are in a very difficult position. Thanks, Carol. Are there any questions or further comments that people want to pick out from the quarter report? OK, 
I know that a lot of these things have obviously been discussed on a regular basis within the executive team as well as part from the, the, the assurance that you gain uh, within the Euron meeting as well, Carol. OK, well, I'm going to we're just going to note that, which is great. And then we're going to move on to the performance report, Charles. Um, thanks, John. And this probably continues a bit in the same vein as the discussion we just had on, on, on quality. Uh, we got some more up to date information at the Finance and Performance Committee yesterday. And also, uh, we have seen some comparative information, uh, both in terms of across the North East and North Cumbria, across the region being the North East and Yorkshire, and then nationally. And I think it's fair to say uh, the whole system's been, been very stressed. And as Peter observed yesterday, when we get uh, January's figures, they're probably likely to be um, e even more challenging, uh, again, across across the board. And as uh, Carol's just been talking about, uh, the, the, the staffing absences definitely uh, has an impact. Uh, I, I remember actually reading or hearing someone in the, in the press saying about, well, the activity, the NHS activity is only the same as it was um, at this time two years ago, pre-COVID. But if you've got 10% of the staff off, then that is quite a, quite a difference. And I guess it's there, there are, there are lies, damn lies and statistics uh, on, 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 on these things. Uh, I think it's also worth perhaps noting, uh, there are some areas of, of, of progress. So. Hopefully, when, when we meet again in March, we'll start to see some of the improvement on the dementia standard that's, that, that's been a concern for uh, a long time. That group got together and we started doing some work and we're seeing some in, improvements there that's positive. As you will see uh, in, uh, in, the, in the finance report, uh, in November, the CCG got an allocation to pass through to North Cumbria of uh, circa two million pounds for additional diagnostic capacity uh, that will be we're not just paying for the kit it's like a a fully managed service the trust are paying for so that should improve uh, waiting times for diagnostics that, that that's a big issue the trust have started implementing i won't uh, i can't apologies can't remember the precise name they're giving it but a sort of very intense weeks where they have a bit of a blast each month to try and particularly tackle uh, trauma and orthopedic waiting where a lot of uh, a lot of patients um, wait wait a long time I think in terms of the medically optimized patients uh, working with the trust on indeed our colleagues in social care uh, I think Cumbria across the piece has, has been as forward thinking as most places to try and do things to alleviate the, 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 the pressure. When we've been on national uh, seminars and events, a lot of the suggestions we've, we've tried them in, in Cumbria, clearly the fundamental challenge is uh, a workforce uh, to support them, but we are trying different things. We're certainly working with uh, the voluntary sector. Uh, we have uh, worked with Cumbria Community Foundation to introduce a, a, a number of schemes to support patients living in their, their home, uh, for example, support from Meals and Wheels, that, that sort of thing that wouldn't be traditionally uh, called healthcare, but working collectively across the piece, that has, that, 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 that has helped. Uh, I guess to uh, end on a couple more positives, uh, if you look at the uh, NWAS figures for North Cumbria, although in many of the performance indicators they are red uh, they are only just red particularly when you compare to the to the rest of NWAS and again when we look at NIAS as well uh, despite all the all the challenges in the main we've still had uh, good or reasonably good response times from from NWAS uh, during, uh, across the winter there have been some tricky times and finally, uh, a good thing to see, uh, the, the latest figures from NCIC is they, they moved down from Opal Level 3 to Opal Level 2 yesterday, which, which again is a good thing. And 
I think we heard this morning the, the level of absence for people either ill or isolating amongst the, the trust staff is has moved to nearer nearer four percent than the, the, the ten percent a couple of weeks ago. So there are some there are some green shoots uh, and we're hoping also uh, to get some initiatives from what's the TIF, which is the I think it's the Transformational Investment Fund. I always get the I always get the acronym wrong, but basically uh, to try and get some additional elective capacity into North Cumbria to again. Uh, uh, address the needs of those patients uh, who've been on the waiting list a long time uh, and as Louise mentioned along with that hopefully seen some benefits from the, the waiting well initiative that recognises the, the impact long waits have and tries to support patients while they're waiting. So I appreciate I haven't actually uh, spoken a lot about the actual contents of the report which is reflects uh, they're a bit out of, out, out of date, but I thought it would be more helpful just to give that overview um, of what the, the, the general position is at the moment that hopefully uh, supplements and enhances other things that have been discussed today. Thank you, Charles. So are there any questions or comments you want to raise? And again, obviously, we, we, we had the well, I know we're going to have comments of the finance report. We had the finance performance meeting yesterday as well, which obviously looked at the the more up to date data, but I really appreciate your your time on that, Charles. I'm gonna just note that. Okay, I've got that. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to Charles. You're on it. You're on again. Favorite yeah. topic: finance. Uh, oh yes, uh, but I will. I know it's not everyone else's, <laughs> so I will. Um, I, I, I will try and be relatively brief here because um, I think generally at month eight and indeed month nine. Uh, we're on track to deliver our financial targets uh, for the second half of the year. Uh, the plan we've put in place um, is, is one where we still have a deficit, but it's lower than the first half of the year, which was lower yeah. than the second half of last year. So I think we're moving in a positive direction there. Uh, we're working as a system, both in terms of us ourselves and NCIC in North Cumbria, but also the wider ICS where, uh, if you like, our challenges are being offset by uh, surpluses in other areas, which is a good thing. And that's that's how it's all supposed to supposed to work. Uh, as you've seen there, we have got some more allocations. We're reporting them today. The biggest ones. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for diagnostic capacity uh, in the trust, and there are still one or, one or two other initiatives we'll continue to get uh, funding for. I think there's a general expectation that probably January, so we'll, we'll hit which which we hear at the end of February, and that sounds like that's a bit bizarre, will be the sort of last month of material funding, just because with all the issues we've talked about, about manpower, it, it, it's difficult to uh, spend spend the money effectively in the, in, in, in the short term. Uh, the other thing that I've alluded to in the report, and I can't really say a lot about because it's still been uh, worked out, is the planning guidance that we touched on earlier uh, came out on the 24th of December. Uh, Santa was early, it came about 10 to 7, um, I think. Um, and in addition to uh, talking about uh, how long CCGs will be about, it, it starts to outline some of the financial priorities. Since that date, um, we've had some draft information that we're still trying to digest. It hasn't come out formally. There are some issues about the financial framework that uh, further clarification, is, I think, is being sought uh, between the Department of Health and, and Treasury, particularly regarding the resources for supporting elective recovery moving into the next the, the next financial year which as we just talked about is a is a key issue and again also which was reflected in that guidance an acceptance that uh, people were dealing with a very pressurized system here and now and while it's important uh, people like myself who who are perhaps not on the 
uh, front line, try and do as much preparatory work as possible in the background. The, the clear guidance was we do not expect operational staff to be involved in, in, in planning uh, straight away because they have other, other immediate priorities. The bit that further complicates that is to understand what the CCG's role will be uh, in the in, in the target three months between uh, April and June. What do we do? What will be done at an ICS level? How will it transition? Uh, how how will the finances work? Particularly when a lot of them that have been published at an ICS ICB level rather than individual CCG. So there's there's quite a lot of things for um, particularly. Uh, uh, pe people in my team to work through and understand that we need to know more about. Uh, we'll continue to update the exec, uh, the Finance and Performance Committee, and indeed the governing body in March as we get a, a, a better handle on those things. Uh, but that was, uh, I guess, when we met last time, it was something we weren't expecting. I think we were expecting a lot of us would be involved in the preparatory work but there wouldn't be a responsibility of the governing body for planning into the next financial year that that has clearly clearly changed. OK, thank you, Charles, and thanks for the update on the finance and some, and some of the planning issues as well for us. Is there anything from anybody that they want some clarity on or comment on? Bear in mind, I know that a lot of this has been discussed in exec, it's been discussed in finance performance, so it's not as though this is new to us. Are we all OK with that? Just to note that formally. Right, thank you. Well, not that. Thank you very much, Charles. So I'm going to have to put my glasses back on now. Um, just in terms of the other items, we're just going through uh, meeting minutes as such. So I, I will ask any of the uh, the chairs of, if they want to pull anything out as, as we just receive these. So in terms of the exec committee on the in October and November of last year, is there anything from either yourself, Mark or Peter that you want to pick up on that? No. OK, no, thank uh, finance and performance for myself for October. I'm just going to raise just to say that, that we did make a submission there for our emergency prevention, preparedness and response uh, self assessment. So I just note that there so that people know that that was one thing that we had to do in terms of that EPR or EPPR. Sorry. Um, Outcomes of Quality Assurance Committee, uh, anything there 10th of November at all? No, thank you, Carol. Then we got to the minutes of the wider system. Uh, Cumbria Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, obviously I'll, I'll update on that from September 2021. Just so people, if you want to sort of delve into it and have a bit more, uh, there's the result of the local government review in there. There's something there about SEND uh, and our SEND improvement process. So I think that's really important for us because we're obviously trying to make sure that that is a priority for us as a CCG as well as the wider partnership. And then also as well, just to make sure people are aware of the what's going on down in Lancashire and South Cumbria ICS, it's their new hospital programme and their various options that they're looking at for basically where do they expand and or renovate or build hospitals in, in their area, which obviously can be relevant for us, particularly the south part of our area. Then they're going to go on to the, um, there's none from the ICP Leaders Board, then Joint Committee for us CCG wise. What you get there is because we've been holding those meetings over the last few months as mainly as a development session and some bits of business. So what you're getting there are the uh, minutes and items that are public facing that, that need to be on websites so people can have access to them. But just again for me to allude to some of those, because I know some of these are, are interesting for people as well who've asked questions about these things. The main ones, just to say there was an annual report there for what the work has been done of the, the Joint Committee, if people are interested in. In July, there's something there about gender dysphoria, and I know that, uh, John, in particular, you've asked some specific questions around that in various meetings, but that was discussed in May and July, so you'll see what was, was done about that. Uh, and also, as well, in the July meeting, you'll see something there, a decision that was made about preterm birth, um, sort of processes and I know Louise you specifically requested some decisions about that so that's where they are. September again some discussions around value-based commissioning policy for people that want to say well where did they make that decision. Uh, in November there was um, 
something there uh, around. Uh, I'm trying to read my own writing here, and I can't. Oh yeah, I can't. I can't read what I've written there. But there you go. There's something interesting in there. Um, and then th th it's not, although it's not on on December. Uh, I was on that list. There are the sort of minutes there for December. And I just wanted to know again, there's some comment made in those minutes about health pathways, which we've alluded ourselves to today, so which is really positive. And there was something, and I know you've raised it, Colin, about medical leadership within the ICS. So just to bear that in mind, uh, that, that that was that, that was there. So they're, they're the only things I wanted to bring to people's attention from those minutes. So everybody happy with that? Yeah. OK. So we're going to then move on. Uh, I know we, we do have one question um, for, from yourself, Sue. You might have others, uh, but I just wanted to, do, do you want to uh, read your question out, Sue, at all? Um, if you, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you, John. Um, I have written it down. I know sometimes when I've asked a question, um, I've, I've been happy if it's gone diverted to somebody on the governing body rather than taking up time and i've always been really grateful for uh, your um, attention on that um but this one i did want to bring to the governing body and i say it with heavy heart because i concur with all the great stuff and the great praise that's gone before and i hope that those of you who know me now know that um, this comes with a bit heavy heart so it's about um visiting um to hospital wards um, I think you'll all know already that there's a lot of concern among members of the public, voluntary bodies, charities and so on, about the restrictive practices that have happened both in care homes and on wards. None of us is not aware of the infection control required and that we must obey those rules. You know, we, we probably don't need to be informed about that. We do know. So my concerns are around the apparent inconsistencies among wards and departments and even ward managers who make decisions. Um, from the website, there's a bit of flexibility in respect of birth partners and sick children. And I'd heard in respect of those at end of life, but I couldn't find that. But those with dementia and other older persons seem to be stuck in hospital and they have not fared well. And I was shocked to hear a quotation by a nurse, not in Cumbria, Hasn't it been easier without the visitors? Easier for whom? So my question is, um, what has happened in respect of those in hospital with dementia who need support under John's campaign? And I think they have managed to sustain that at Burness General with their matron there who's called Diane Smith, who's given me permission to share that. Are there essential caregivers nominated to those older patients who need support and had support before they were admitted. They are partners in care. And what's happening to begin the process of reinstating visiting and can members of the public be involved in that process? And I'm really concerned that these restrictions might become hardwired and patients and families may not be consulted. It's contributing to the poor care of some of our older people in hospital who've been deprived of you know um, touch and a friendly voice and comfort and all of that um, and so those are my concerns I can put this together and email it to relevant people if you'd prefer but I think it's something that that you should all know my feelings about and be aware of and perhaps you might have some answers or can it be on the agenda going forward thank Great. you Thank, thanks for that, Sue. And obviously, just trying to pick out some of the things you said there. Some relate specifically to dementia, and some relate to visiting generally. I think, was, was, and then comparisons between different organisations, Furness, obviously in Cumbria, and presumably NCIC for us. Obviously, it, it's not our organisation, but we have a responsibility in terms of commissioning. But P Peter, is there anything you want to specifically say? And if if we need to spend a bit more time, then going back and maybe referring this into NCIC to support Sue in that. Uh, I'll just, is there anything you want to sort of comment on that, Peter, please? I, I, I can briefly. Um, so thank you, Steve, for raising it. I, I think you would expect that we we all have a lot of sympathy and empathy with the general spirit in which you're raising this. Um, and 
you know, they, they've always been mixed views about visiting, but no question, isolation for people in hospital wards is not is not good for their physical well-being or their emotional well-being, and not something that should be extended for any longer than it needs to be. Um, I think the the current position largely is that um, booking uh, visiting is still available if booked, and they do request people undertake a, have a negative lateral flow test for obvious reasons, for obvious reasons. Um, on occasions on some wards, including some of the uh, older adult wards that typically have higher numbers of patients with dementia, so there have been some further restrictions which have been because of COVID outbreak in some of those wards. So that obviously disrupts things. Um, but on your general point about encouraging appropriate, well-managed um, carer, family, friends, um, support to people while they're in their in, inpatient stay. I would I would hope and expect that that would be supported by all, all of the nursing and other staff in all of our local trusts. But rather than dwelling on this now, Sue, I think what might be helpful, if you've got particular concerns, by all means, send them through to us. If you Perhaps if they go to Brenda first, then we'll go from there. And if we need to pick up any issues with um, specific provider organisations, then we'll happily seek to do that thank you peter okay i just uh i noticed louise thanks for your comment it wasn't just coronavirus it was some norovirus outbreaks as well colin just anything you want to say on this uh and then i know john you've got your hand up but just go ahead um well john at some stage there's going to have to be a return to the new normal in which case um in the new normal there have to be a, a involvement of patient groups towards that new normal, and there would have to be um, a series of phased re-steps depending on the reality of any particular circumstance, be it individual patients or. So I think, John, and it obviously is um, up to ourselves and our normal interactions with the trust to uh, make a request that they. And it's not just NCIC, it's CNTW, it's all, it's all of our provider units, including um, the care environments, care homes, uh, which we do, in, of course, with partnership with uh, the, uh, the council, that there, there should be a, a journey to what the new normal will look like a returning to business as usual, and that there should be some outlining of what people are expecting and that this, the question could be asked. So, John, I think we can be a little bit firmer with um, the, the reply to Susan. I, I think um, um, the, the, it's nearly impossible just to stand back and wait to see what will fall out in the next few months. I think that would be too chaotic. Um, so I think it does behove us, John, to, as a commissioner, seek to produce some sort of framework. Um, Thank you. So um, I, I'll leave that with colleagues um, to think about where the best place would be to bring that up. Thank you. OK, no, thank you, Colin. John, thank your you. comments on this and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. is exactly the same in support of Susan and in, in terms of what Colin said. I've got a mum in an elderly care uh, nursing home in the North East and the impact of restrictive visiting is quite harsh. I understand entirely while it's there, but there is some inconsistency across the system. And I think, as Colin says, as a commissioner, it, it behoves us to do something to try and get it a bit more consistent. OK, thanks for that. Sue, is that OK in terms of the initial response? Uh, and yes. I think Bre Brenda, I think you have her email anyway, but she has put her email on the chat there if you want to pick that up. And thank you for raising that, Sue, because... Well, thank, uh, thank you for your support, yes, Colin. Yeah. So, and I would happily be involved in anything that could make it better. No, and again, your ongoing support at various places in this health system is much appreciated, Sue. So I know, you know, I know you just don't attend this meeting. You've been active for a long time, and we appreciate it. Okay, is there anything else you would want to ask, Sue? Bear, bear in mind the the conversation we've had during the, the course of the day. Are you okay with that? Okay, right. I'm going to take it as a success that we've nearly finished because it does say quarter past, and we did start later as well uh, the only other thing i wanted to mention i have now worked out my own writing and double checked those minutes for the joint committee it is relevant actually for the 11th of november refers to the northeast of north cumbria approach to surgery and the waiting well 
process, which I know Mandy's outlined in the chat as well. So if you want to have a look at that, there were some notes made in there. So and I think that is important because that's about how we manage this transition. OK, uh, we as I've said, that there's no other urgent items of business. The date and time is is out there. Uh, it's one o'clock Thursday, the 17th of March. It will be by Microsoft Teams again. I did say at the very start of the meeting that, that that's how we're going to do it for, for the reasons that I've articulated. Um, and we've got a break now uh, and I just we, we are I'm going to give ourselves 20 minutes because I've put on there 1530. Sorry, Peter, you've got your hand up. Sorry, I, go on, mate. Go on. Um, only a really practical uh, thing, John. Um, I think there's a separate link for the part. There is. There. Yes, um, there is. I, I just wonder if 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 we have the same trouble, if we can just uh, have uh, a plan for. I like that emergency preparedness. I like that, Peter. Thank you. That's you can put that on the self assessment. Uh, yes. So what we'll do is I'm going to put that in the hands of Brenda and Julie. That if we have a problem, watch your emails and we'll, you'll get another link coming in. Um, that will be very similar to how we started off this meeting. But thanks for that reminder, Peter. That was very useful. Are we all OK, guys? Anything we want to finish off before we move on to the next one? So half past, resume back again on the other link. Fingers crossed. If not, it's on a new link that's come out. In fact, no, Julie's not here, is she? It'll be Brenda. You're in charge. Brenda, it's just solely down to you. <laughs> Yeah, I'll send you a little bit of a pass, Brenda, in rugby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you later, guys. <laughs> See you soon. Bye bye. Thanks for your time. Bye. Thanks a lot, Sue. Bye bye. Bye, Sue.